So in one of the printed programs, it says something really grand, like I co-founded Critical Resistance with Angela Y. Davis. Angela and I were two of about 30 people who together started that abolitionist um, organization. So it wasn't just the two of us, and although I'm always pleased for my name to be linked, with the great Angela Y. Davis's, there were a lot of other people uh, involved. If I had the time, I would list them. All right, I am an abolitionist. Abolition. Abolition is a plot against racial capitalism, which is all capitalism, not just some of it. It is a plot in a narrative sense. It is a plot in which the arc of change is always going resolutely toward freedom. It is a plot in a geographic sense. It is a plot in which we aim to make all space, not just some space, free in two senses. Free in the sense that it cannot be alienated, which is to say sold by anybody to anybody. And free in the sense of non-exclusive. There is no boundary or border that would keep somebody in or keep somebody out. That is abolition. That's the plot. That's my plot. It is an internationalist impulse that is part of what many of us call the black radical tradition, which is open for all. It's not just for black people. I'm going to talk about the criminals, um, because your innocence will not save you, as Nancy's remarks should have indicated by now. And I will talk about a couple of um, actions that have happened in California recently to give um, meat to my observation. In the California state prisons, recently, over the last couple of years, at the same time that North Africa and West Asia were exploding into well-documented in the mainstream media in the USA uprisings, there was an uprising that was organized as a hunger strike. This uprising was organized by prisoners who are in indefinite detention inside prison. So they're already convicted. They're doing time, and then they're doing time indefinitely inside the prison. They're in a prison in the prison. They're in what's called the security housing unit, which some of you might know about. It's a form of imprisonment that was innovated in the former West Germany, where in the absence of a death penalty, the um, uh, forces of uh, both state and, and corrections in West Germany were trying to figure out how to wipe out the Red Brigade. They had caught the Red Brigade, they had tried and convicted those people, but they couldn't execute them because they didn't have a death penalty. And the purpose of the shoe was to induce death in the people locked in it. And that is what it does. It makes people crazy. Everybody knows that it is a violation of human rights to keep anybody in solitary confinement for more than 15 days. And there are people who have been in the security housing unit in California for 15 and more years. Years and they can never get out. There's one man I know, I've talked to many times, who's been in the hall since 1973. The prisoners in the security housing unit are divided by race and region. And this is part of the deliberate plan uh, uh, by the California Department of, Direction, of Corrections, Directions and Corrections, to keep people apart inside. The department innovated this process, not just as a reflection of the divisions outside, even though we know that the U.S. is more segregated by race and class now than it was in 1960, they innovated this kind of division inside to break apart radical prisoner organizing that was the hallmark of prisons in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, as many of you might know, either from memory or from study. And in dividing the prisoners into these groupings by race and region, they effectively established prison gangs inside and then fomented warfare between them. They did this, the Department of Corrections, in order to get the prisoners' minds off the oppressor, the guards, and onto each other. That plus television worked. It worked very well. So the prisoners have been in the hold now for decades and decades and decades. They put forward demands in, um, uh, that their hunger strike was uh, the, the force behind, asking for rather simple, straightforward things. They asked for a way to get out of indefinite detention without doing one of three things, which are the only way to get out now. You snitch, you parole, or you die. Right? They said, we don't want to snitch. Many of us will never parole. We're doing life. And we don't want to die in the hole. 
So give us a way to get out. They asked for adequate nutrition because as the prison system has grown and grown, it's figured out ways to squeeze, and it's totally public. It's totally public, it's totally public. Write that down. It's figured out ways to squeeze resources out of the bodies of prisoners so that the resources that, that circulate through the prison will circulate mostly in the form of wages to both guard and non-guard staff and to pay the utilities that keep those cities running because the prison is a city. And the prisoners asked for some other things as well. The Department of Corrections cavalierly um, refused to meet the prisoners' demands and offered a counterproposal that was insulting uh, 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 at best. However, tens of thousands of prisoners throughout the California state system and some in systems beyond California joined the hunger strike in solidarity with those in the security housing unit. When the Department of Corrections response came out, the department, of course, then hunkered down for some kind of violent uprising. That's not what happened, not surprisingly. The prisoners who are in solitary confinement, who actually spend 23 hours a day locked in their, in their cells, who sometimes get to go one hour a day and walk up and down in a little pen that you wouldn't even put your dog into if you had a dog to put in a pen, people who have never seen the horizon in all the years that they've been uh, locked up, those people put together a new set of demands. And their new demands, instead of going uh, vertically up to their keepers, were sent out horizontally to everybody else locked up in all the communities that they came from. And they sent out demands uh, uh, horizontally to end the hostilities between the races. This is huge. It's huge because the people who have been locked inside, who have in one way or another, wittingly or not, participated in the race and ethnic war that the department fomented in order to secure itself as a department, have now seen and refused to be participants in that anymore and have sent word out to the communities they come from to do the same kind of thing. This is a very frightening thing in the United States of America where our division is always very important for the security of racial capitalism and the contemporary neoliberal state. So I call that to your attention. The second case I wanna give, um, describe to you very briefly are gang injunction zones. And these are places that are outside of prisons and jails. They are in communities. It is a form of spatial control that is enacted through civil law, not criminal law, civil law. And what civil law does is to divide up the spaces of the communities, of the cities and municipalities and neighborhoods, where people who have been convicted of certain crimes, some of their associates and some of their associates' associates are forbidden to go. Now, many people imagine that what gang injunctions do is keep you know, uh, uh, low income, mostly male, uh, persons of color out of, say, gentrified areas. That's not what it does. Divides up people and separates people from their communities, from their neighborhoods, from their streets, from their households, from their families. That's what gang injunctions do. So people have been organizing all over the United States to fight against gang injunctions, and I don't have time to give you the history of gang injunctions, but it goes pretty much hand in hand with the history of the security housing unit that I laid out for you in the case of the California uh, Department of Corrections. Now, uh, as I think I said earlier, and if I didn't, I should have said, and I will say again, innocence doesn't save anybody. So making an argument that one is not a criminal, and therefore we know who the criminals are, is not going to save one single person, none of the people we advocate for, and certainly not, our, not ourselves. Because if an injury to one is an injury to, to all, that means, among other things, that the criminalization of one is the criminalization of all, and we should take that seriously. I see that my good friend Fahd Ahmed is here, and he's going to be speaking this afternoon, and he might bring up in greater detail what I will describe to you very briefly. In the New York City Terrorism Interdiction Unit, not unlike the Boston one that Nancy was describing, um, good, that Nancy was describing, um, that unit, uh, uh, somebody inside that unit, leaked to us on the outside a one day brief from that unit to the chief of police, to Ray Kelly. On that one day brief, one single day, it's 2008, right, Fon? Like April something, 2008. 
it started with, in the wake of the um, acquittal of several police officers in the murder of Sean Bell, the police are to watch a certain independent black mosque. Then it goes through critical resistance, Desi's Rising Up moving, moving. Um, uh, the Gina Six, which is in Louisiana. It mentions by name a number, number of people in critical resistance and uh, in other organizations. It goes on for two and a half pages. And toward the end, the target is Muslim student organizations in the City University of New York, and particularly a vacation that a group of students took that one of the spies went along on, where they went upstate in New York, went rafting, prayed, and talked about religion. That's one day's report. So the connection between all of us and the impossibility of making a bright line between criminalist, uh, people who have been convicted of crimes and those who haven't uh, should be apparent. Civil death stalks the land. Human rights might be the response to civil death, as Malcolm X argued, but that answer has got to be aspirational civil uh, uh, human rights in the form of abolition, not the scientific sort of human rights that is being practiced today as though there were a technical response to every problem. I.O. Weizmann calls the kind of, of human rights that are being practiced today that, that condone 29 people being killed at, by a drone, but not 31, lawfare, and we cannot uh, succumb to lawfare in order to try to read, reach our goals. Innocence is no defense. Abolition is the only offense against the human sacrifice that brought us here together today. Thank you.